Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may ever embrace and hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, that's what I wanted to get done. And then from beginning. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll, really, this section, we laid some groundwork way back at the beginning. And, and we're, a lot of that groundwork was applying specifically to what we're going to be looking at today. So I just wanted to go back over them again. Um, and one of the more important ones is that we all have biases. Um, we, we may try not to, but the fact is we all do with everything we do. And it's a little like sunglasses that have different shades. Depending on which one we're wearing impacts what it is we think we're seeing or how we see what we're looking at. And, and the, the big question for this is do we see God as a loving, caring, forgiving parent, always willing to, to look for a reason to forgive? Or do we see God as an angry, judgmental, vindictive parent? And probably none of us are at the far end of that spectrum at either end, but we're, all, we're, we're kind of toward one side or kind of toward the other. And if you haven't picked up on it already, I'm at the God loving, always looking for a reason to forgive. I'm fairly far in that direction uh, on this spectrum. And so that's the viewpoint, that's the bias from which I look at scripture and particularly these last few chapters of Revelation. Um, another thing we talked about is that the Bible is a gift to us given by God. And for that reason, we can uh, pretty much assume God wants us to understand. The implication of that is when we feel like we need to twist the scriptures around like a pretzel and maybe do it like a jigsaw puzzle, grab a few words off of this book and a few words off of this book and insert them into what... We're probably going about it wrong. That doesn't describe something you want people to understand. So we need to be careful when we start doing too much of that to step back and ask ourselves, what is it exactly God's trying to say? And another way to look at that is, is the Bible God's promise or God's threat? And I think we all know, you know, we probably have heard people who, if you listen carefully, it comes across more as a threat than a promise. And I remember saying that the Bible structure is a little like a mystery novel in the sense that the very beginning kind of sets the stage and tells you what's going to happen or the direction things are going in. And then the end pulls all the hints, all the clues together and clarifies things. And the, and the uh, Bible's pretty much like that. The first two and a half chapters of Genesis set the, set the tone, get us ready. Um, the last four chapters of Revelation reach back into the various parts of the book, connecting directly to some of Genesis and say, okay, now this is what all that meant. This is how we're going. And in my opinion, the, the, the one verse that is most important in understanding the rest of the Bible is Genesis 131. God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good. But the question, again, back to bias, that can be understood a couple different ways. The way I understand it is God saw what had happened, what God had created, and God said it was very good not just at the moment, but was going to be very good. That God knew there were going to be bad times, if you will. But God wasn't necessarily surprised by any of that. God knew about it. 
The other way to look at it, and, and if you listen carefully to people, this is affect what they're saying. They won't admit to it until you challenge them on, on verse uh, Genesis 131, is God was surprised. It was good when it was created, but then it went bad. And that wasn't what God planned. God didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and that, that, that's, again, that, that's, a, that's a really important question to ask ourselves which direction we're coming from. Because if, if we believe God knew what was going to happen, that God has set up, this, and I'm not talking about a plan that has every person's individual moment planned out, that kind of thing. But in broad strokes, God knew there was going to be some things that were going to go poorly. Jesus was going to come, things would get better, and then we'd have an ending. Boy, that was a simplified version, wasn't it? Um, that if we believe that, then what we have is a difficulty saying that at the end, God's just going to throw up his hands and say, oh, my God, let's forget about all this. Let's just give it up and start all over. So it, it really does matter where we're coming from when we try to understand what it is we're reading. All right, I, I'm not going to take the time to read every verse on this. And I decided just within the last little bit, like 15 minutes, that what I will do is I will actually send my notes out to you. They are very much notes. They, you know, they're not organized really well, but I'm going to give you, give you a lot of things and I want you to have a chance to go back and look at them. Most of them are cross-referenced to my sources. So that, that hopefully will help. So the beginning, uh, halfway through uh, the 19th chapter, chapter 19 of Revelation, we start to get what is really the first time we have this kind of conflict in the sense that for the first time we hear that Jesus, and notice how right at the end of the, of the verses, we're told who this person is, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we have him uh, showing up and we have a battle starting to be fought. Um, and the emphasis that we get on all of this is that you're going to see the ultimate destruction of evil. And what's interesting is over the next couple chapters, you will see that that thought comes back a number of times that evil finally is destroyed once and forever. Oh, come on down. Sorry, my screen isn't changing for some reason. Ah, there we go. A um, little further in, in uh, chapter 19, one of the things to watch for, particularly in these three, these three, four chapters, is who is involved. Most of the time it's an angel, and it's if we're not careful, we can automatically assume it's Jesus. But most of the time it's an angel, and we have not really yet seen God. We've seen the angels, we've seen Jesus, but we really haven't seen God. God God's going to come in in just a minute. Um, what we have here, I saw the monster and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered for war with the one who sits on the horse, Jesus, and his army. And the monster was captured, and with it, the false prophets. We end up with several different words for the evil one, um, and it's, it's not clear if they're supposed to be referring to different but I'm thinking this probably all meant to be the same uh, creature, whatever word you want to use there. As I said, the emphasis is on the complete and final defeat of evil. We've been talking up to this point about the beast, Rome, um, and, the, and the, the way Rome has mistreated the Christians. Now we've actually shifted and started to look at the power behind the power. We're spending more emphasis now looking at Satan, looking at evil as a spiritual influence on, on Rome and everyone else. Um, and it's kind of interesting. We have stepped behind fighting the earthly powers to focus more on fighting the ultimate power. And we see that happening. Um, the lake of fire, 
is maybe the most important image in all of this in trying to understand what's going on, but we're going to come back to that because this one, it makes actually, um, I won't say it makes more sense, but it's more important in, in when it's used again in a couple minutes. Revelation 20, again, remember you see, and this is something I've heard more than one preacher misstate. It's the angel who locks Satan, the devil, in the abyss is not Jesus. Um, he tied him up for a thousand years, and then until a thousand years are complete, after that he must hear this must be let out. For he didn't escape; he was let out. Um, he will come to deceive the nations at the four corners of the world, and down a little below. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into a lake of fire and sulfur where the monster and the false prophet had already been thrown. So we have the devil, we have Satan, we have monster, we have false prophet. Like I said, there's several different, I don't think they're different characters. I think it's just different names for the same evil force. But I also don't think that's particularly important. So what we have here, this is the only place, this is, this is an important fact. Despite all the talk you get in the people who do the Left Behind series and all that kind of, this is the only place this thousand years is mentioned. If it were that important for us to understand, you'd think it would come up more often than one place, one chapter. Uh, most likely it's meant to be symbolic. There's no reason to think it's not. So in this case, it would read something like, um, until the time was totally and completely finished, something like that. So it isn't necessarily a number of days or hours, but it's when your project is done, when, the, when what needed to be accomplished had been accomplished. Uh, Mickey Eford looks at this, um, and I think he's right on, that what we're being told is not necessarily... Um, exclusively a spiritual battle in the sense that it's being done somewhere other than on earth. Uh, Ifrit is very, very um, solid, very consistent in saying Satan is bound when human beings refuse to follow him. All right. The bounding of Satan is really when humans reject Satan. And then if no one follows Satan, He's bound, but if then people start turning away from God, then Satan is loose. And that's, that's, that's kind of important because what's going on here with Satan being loose is uh, that he still has a role to play. There's still something going on where he has something to do. In fact, it's kind of interesting that uh, Wright uh, parallels this with uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, over and over again, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan like I am, um, there's opportunities and threats to Gollum. And Gandalf says, no, he ha still has a role to play. And then the movie totally messes up the theology. I, they, they, those people ought to be shot. But anyway, the book handles it well. Um, so it's the same type of thing. Satan still has some kind of role to play, although... We're not 100% what it is. So then we go, when the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released and he will come to deceive. What seems to be happening here, remember, Satan is the tempter. Satan is the one who leads people away from God. So what seems to be happening here is that um, Satan's being given one more opportunity to identify people who are not really following God. All right, that makes sense. In other words, Satan will be in the world, and because of Satan's um, efforts to tempt people, it'll become obvious who will fall into temptation, who will not stay loyal to God. Uh, and the thing about him then being thrown into the lake of fire, I, I loved, uh, let's see, who, whose was it? Uh, I think it was Wright that said it. Um, yeah, he, he said, think of Satan like the broom you use to clean up contamination. 
you sweep up the bad stuff and then you throw the broom away too. So Satan was kind of like that. He did his role, which was to identify the people who were not completely um, loyal to God. And then he gets, you know, then he's, then he's, he's discarded, if you will. Um, that's the USA. Oh, Gog and Magog. Well, that's actually quite fascinating. And today, um, I don't know how many people know this, but Vladimir Putin has used that image to justify, that very image to justify attacking the Ukraine. And this has come up many times in history when somebody has been, um, somebody wants to justify that kind of war. They've come to this verse claiming that, and I, I, I can't follow the logic. I, don't ask me to follow their logic. I have no, I, I can't do it. But claiming in somehow they're being on God's side. Now, among other things, one of the things that is very clear in Revelation, although lots of people don't seem to figure this out, one of the things that's very clear in Revelation is God does not need human armies. At no point do human armies help God. At no point does God, God, when God gets ready, God just takes over and wins. You know, so, you know, the Russians attacking uh, Ukraine in, in no way, shape, manner, or form can be considered um, in line with what God wants to happen according to Revelation. So it's, it's just, it just astonishes me when people try to pull that off. Um, they are, by the way, apparently from every, you know, apparently, and if you look at this the four corners of the earth, they're just meant to be symbolic of all nations. And the actual phrase comes from Ezekiel 38 and 39. So this is another case. We've talked about this in the past where John has put something in here that a Jew would pick up automatically, would just, would just know what he's talking about. A non-Jew wouldn't notice it, but it really wouldn't matter. If you didn't pick up the, the, the connection with Ezekiel, it doesn't really minimize what's being taught. Uh, let's see, what else? Okay, right, um, and we'll pick this up. If you're reading, if you're reading at any time with uh, Dr. Wright's books, he is, he is very much a believer in the bodily resurrection. Um, and he uses a phrase that I really don't like, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. He says the first heaven and earth were a pilot project. Um, the, uh, you, you tend to throw a pilot project out. I don't think that's it. And we'll talk about some other images we can use in just a moment, but that one... I share with you, but I do not like. Uh, get this out of my way. Then I saw a large white throne, and, the, and here we have God. All of a sudden, God is actually here. God, the judger, is, is now here. And we get to this book of life, which is another fascinating image that we're never 100% sure what it means but lots of people, um, lots of people will tell you they know what it was and take off on it. Um, it certainly gets down. It certainly looks a little like predestination. But most important, if you look down, each was judged in accordance with what they had done. That's my bolding, by the way. Um, because that, that is such a used question. It, it certainly comes across like works righteousness. You get what you deserve. You have to earn your points to be in the, in the book of life and all that kind of thing. I, I, I can't go there. Um, but I do think it, it's possible that everyone's name is there and we are given the option of erasing our name. In other words, it isn't that we earn our way into the book as much as we, and I don't think it's actually a physical book or anything like that, but 
it's not so much we earn our way into the book as we can take ourselves out of it. Um, we have that option. And what if we're looking at, and, and these two images, there's a lot of overlap, so don't, don't try to separate them too thoroughly. What if it's talking more about our attitude toward God, our desire to follow God, as opposed to specific actions? I mean, we've all failed in specific actions. But what if what it's really talking about is where do we want to be? All right. Now, understand that's that's theology according to Ken Cruz. Uh, <laughs> it is not um, official in anybody's that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's somebody that agrees with me. But anyway, um, Eford, Eford phrases it, God does not exclude people exclude themselves. All right, we're back to the lake of fire. And as I said before, this is one of the absolute most important images in the whole section. And one more time, it depends on our bias. Um, throughout scripture, fire is used in two very different ways. Most of the time, it's used as a way to refine Metal is put into fire to refine and purify the metal. The refining fire is a fairly common image, but there are times it's used as destruction. I think as you look at all that's written, and we'll get, I'll, I'll try to point out as we go on, all that's written in these last couple chapters of Revelation, it is talking about a refining fire. It is talking about something that a person would go through to burn their sins away, if, if you like that image, um, rather than something that destroys the sinner. And lots of people disagree with me, okay? I'm very honest about that, but that's, my, that's where I come from. And I love this comment by Brett Davis. Um, Eford, and if you haven't had a chance to look at the three books, with, you know, that's a lot for one person to be looking at. But um, Ephraim and Wright are definitely more um, academic and very, both very readable. But, but, you know, they worry about the uh, Greek translations and which verb tense it is and stuff like that. Um, Brett Davis is more, he's an evangelical. Notice, if you haven't picked up on it, notice his title. Down here at the bottom, the gospel, according to Revelation, if you remember, gospel means good news. So his title means the good news, according to um, Revelation. And he has more of a conceptual look at it than, than a nitpicky uh, uh, issue by issue type of look. So anyway, here he says, and this seems to me John's symbolic shorthand for whether or not we allow God's love to embrace us. This is the heart of Christianity, colon, the insistence that God already, always loves you and claims you. And every one of us is invited to trust that. His choice for us and our trusting of him is all that matters in the end. So I think that that says better than I did where I was trying to go with the with the uh, the book of life. It's a matter of do we trust God and those who do not remove their names from it. Well, why are you not? I don't know why my thing is not moving. There we go. All right, here it, this this here here is here is the point. I probably have already said this a couple of times. But anyway, <laughs> here is a very frequently misunderstood point. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. This is not, it doesn't say in scripture that heaven's a different dimension we're all going to fly off into, which of course is the image lots of people have of heaven. Um, now, in be the in-between times, between our physical death and the final second coming and all that, uh, that's not clear. Scripture really doesn't give us any guidance on that. 
But certainly in the ultimate, it says very, very, very clearly that going back to Genesis 131, God knew, said it was very good and God's going to stick around and, and, and redeem it. God's going to transform it. Um, no longer any sea. You may recall that um, in scripture, sea is chaos. The Jews were not big seagoing people. Uh, they did not sail a lot in the Mediterranean or anything like that. And at that point, of course, in history, that was a dangerous thing to do. Um, so no longer any sea, meaning there's no longer any chaos. And, and as we go on, you'll see several other things have disappeared. Um, God has come to dwell with humans. Uh, that's, that's a fascinating thought, because if you go back to the seventh day of creation, um, it talks about God resting. Well, a, a reasonable way to translate that is God paused or God dwelt with God's creation. That right then it said, God's going to be with us. And if you think about the scriptures, you begin with God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. <laughs> um, God having that very personal connection. I mean, you know, and then over time, it kind of gets less and less. God begins to speak through the prophets, have a personal connection with a prophet who then shared. And then Jesus comes and has a very personal, but it, we have to remember Jesus's personal connection with human beings was with a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of human beings. I don't know, 0.1% or something. I mean, because, you know, again, we, we tend to think of Jesus in Israel and forget about all the rest of the world. Um, so we still have a case where, yeah, God's connected with, Je with Jesus. We, I love the case of God connected with human beings, but not all that not very many people and not that directly. Now we have God sitting right among us. We have God coming and being right in our midst. Um, and he, he says, look, I am making all things new. Again, it, you know, you can work with that translation a lot. It's, it's, a reason, it's a good translation. What I hear there is transformation not destruction and rebuilding. Um, Rehabilit in, in, in modern terms, what I'm going to call it, re rehabilitating the building, not tearing it down and starting over. That God is saying, I am going to, uh, um, I'm going to transform this world into what it was supposed to be to begin with. Then down below, we have a fascinating thought. Um, but as for the cowards, faithless people, the unclean, murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, um, their destiny will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The second death part um, conflicts with my thinking in the sense that it, you can use that against my thought, that the lake is for um, refining. But I still think it's the death of sinning the death of sinfulness. That whole list there you have is, you know, is clearly those people who oppose God. It's just examples of those people who oppose God. The cowards are those who would not oppose the Romans, even though the Romans were insisting that they, um, they worship Rome, they worship the Roman Empire, emperor. Uh, the cowards were the ones that wouldn't do it. The faithless people, the unclean, you know, are all fornicators throughout the Old Testament. Sexual misconduct is used as a symbol of not being uh, faithful to God. So it's all ties together uh, there. Now, again, we're talking about an angel speaking to John in, in this vision. And again, we see Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, um, not taking off to some other place, but we're actually talking about the, the God now dwelling with human beings. The high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels, 12, of course, is complete humans, 
all human beings. So that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and then we get to the description. And I, I, I think one of the places people get really off base is they try to figure out what the uh, uh, onyx means or what the sapphire, you know, the sapphire. No, what this whole image is of something that is so glorious and amazing and valuable that there are no human words to really describe it. Um, the, the measurements, 1,500 miles, uh, you know, I, 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 more than one scholar will tell you that that is the length of uh, the Roman emperor, Empire at that point from east to west was about 1,500 miles. I, I don't go there. I, I think, again, why all of a sudden take numbers that have been some symbolic and say they're not? And 12,000 stadia is uh, 12 times 10 times 10 times 10, you know, a complete length. Um, 144 is 12 times 12. You know, I, I don't see any reason to see it anywhere else, any other way. Down in 22, I saw no temple in the city because the Lord God, the Almighty, is its temple. Um, that, that's that's an interesting thing in in modern um, I don't want to even say theology. In modern church talk, we have kind of changed that. We've made this big thing about God is everywhere, and I agree with that. I'm, I'm totally with that. But certainly in the past, the idea of the temple was where God dwelt. So you, and, and again, we're not way far apart in the thinking. It's subtle. Um, so you went to the temple to be with God. Remember when the Samaritan woman asked, where can they worship? Because the Jews say you could only worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, soon you will be able to worship everywhere. Well, that's the point. There's no, there's no need for a temple if God's there. God's already there. Uh, no need of sun or moon. Remember what the very first creation was, was the sun. So we're again linking the the beginning of the Bible and the end. And then the 25, again, the bold is mine. It's not uh, in scripture. I, at least for me personally, this is the most important phrase in the entire Bible. Its gates will never be shut. The temple will never be closed. And we're going to talk in a minute about how it says there's still people outside, which to me says there's always the opportunity to enter it at another time. Again, lots of people, I don't know, maybe most people, <laughs> disagree with me, but there are two, and there's two ways to read that. If you're in, if you're, you're focused more on judgment, then the way to read that is the gates will never be shut because there's no evil people left. So there's no need to shut the gates. But I, you know, that just doesn't read right to me. And the other way to read it is that people will always continue to have the chance to change to such a point that they're now welcome in. Um, one of the things all three of the authors talk about a lot is the idea of signposts that what we are seeing today and what we see, in, in, in other words, today in our lives and what we see throughout the Bible and what we see particularly in Revelation are signposts that send us in the right direction but are not the final destination. Uh, let me read you a couple quotes from Wright. Advanced signposts to the almost unthinkable reality to which nevertheless so much of the New Testament points that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk 2.14. That is the goal towards which so much of the scripture is pointing, a goal forgotten by those who imagine the whole aim is to leave earth behind and go somewhere else. Heaven has come down to earth. Why would we want it otherwise? We have the reality. We don't need the signpost anymore. 
I like that because he's saying kind of what I've been saying is that the whole Bible is leading us in this direction. It's giving us hints. It's giving us clues. And now we're beginning to see where the real destination is. Uh, another quote, the whole of Christian theology is based on the goodness of creation. Yet the goodness of creation consists partly in this, that it points beyond itself to the new creation. This, this I think, really, his next point is really important. It isn't the case that the new creation was an afterthought, a plan B, once the first creation had gone so badly wrong. Human sin has meant that God's eventual design has had to arrive by a long, winding, and often tear-stained and bloody-spattered route. So, again, it's not that God has just said, to heck with it, I'm going to start all over. Um, then Davis, and again, I, I like Davis's phrasing, it isn't quite as uh, academic, but anyway, when we labor for unity, strive for healing, work for justice, broker peace, forgive sins, speak truth, lay down our lives for one another. When we do those things, we are following the lamb, living as citizens of the world, which will last. He talks about how we have the right to enter, you know, in a way, enter the new Jerusalem. It right now, we don't have to wait, you know, and again, he's not taking that that specifically, obviously, but the point is we can get closer to God than we have been. All right, 22. Um, now we're at the very end. And we have, remember your, remember your Garden of Eden, of Eden uh, the river the, of the water of life. We have the tree of life. Um, but then in, in, we, we actually get to some, some kind of interesting. Let the unjust go on being unjust and the filthy go on being filthy and the let the just go on doing justice and let the holy still be holy. And down below, by its gates, but the dogs, the sorcerers, the fornicators, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves to invent lies, they will all be outside. So this is what I meant about the fact we have the we have the um, New Jerusalem, uh, which, by the way, if you go back and look at the dimensions, one of the things I forgot to mention is it's a cube, and a cube was considered the ideal shape. The cube, the perfect cube was considered the perfect shape. Um, we have this cube, the New Jerusalem, with the gates still open. And here it says there will be people left outside. One of the fascinating things is as you go through here, there's a couple hints that suggest that that river of the water of life does not stop at the edge of Jerusalem. It, it isn't clear. It isn't clear. But uh, there's a couple of words in there that make me think that's going out to still water those outside who, who need it. Um, it, it does say, do not seal up the words that God wants to be understood. Like, like I say, let the unjust, that's fascinating. Um, Ephraim said, look, I am coming soon. And he raises the question, and this is something he has raised throughout his discussion of Revelation. Is this really a discussion of the end of time? Or, or at least the end of the world as we know it. Or is it a discussion of the end of the torture Christians have been going through at that point? And he points out that about the same year this was written, you know, we don't know precisely, but it seems like that the uh, Domitian, Domitian, the uh, Roman Empire died, and with his death, a lot of the persecution ended. And the let the unjust go on being unjust certainly sounds like an acknowledgement that things will get better, but there will still be evil happening, which wouldn't be the case if we're talking about the end of the world as we know it and the full arrival of, the, uh, of heaven on earth. I think there's enough 
that point to this being the full arrival to be okay with that, to say um, that's what we're talking about. But I certainly can, can understand uh, that. Plus the other thing is, I, I'm, I'm, if, if you recall one of the debates around Christmas time, you have the, you have the passage that says, um, to you a son, uh, son will be given. And a lot of people argue that that was, was not about Jesus. It was about the king at that point in history. I've never figured out why it couldn't be both. Um, the, I, I, you know, I point out that you can read Moby Dick as some guy bragging about a fish, fishing trip. <laughs> or you can wrote, read Moby Dick at a lot deeper level. And in some way, it may be both. Maybe some of both. Well, I don't have any reason to think that. This couldn't be both to be saying you're going to have some improvement, but we still have a ways to before we get to the final. I, again, I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of difference to us personally. Um, let me end what I wanted to say with a quote from um, Davis. Davis says, this is the happiest possible ending to the Bible. A world remade by love. Signpost, the destination is clear by the path, still holds twists and turns. The real question is, who is God? If we answer that God is self-giving love, then we get the directions. And I absolutely think the next, next sentence summarizes my understanding of Revelation. Revelation uses sacred art to point us toward reality. I love that idea of all the imagery being sacred art. Like you might go into a cathedral and see the um, stained glass windows or the icons or whatever. And none of those are the reality, but they are ways we may 